Peter S. Beagle. And also moderating the discussion is Connor Cochran of the Conlon Press. Would you please give a warm welcome to you? Oh, good. Good from there? I'll be running around. Okay. Okay. Hi, everybody. If you have a question, put up your hand in the air. I will run to you with this microphone. But first, of course, yes, step into the light, Peter. Come into the light. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here. It's been a very long time. The last time I pa it was passing through, I wasn't really in Silver Spring. I stayed the night with a friend. But that was 1973. Wow. I haven't been back since. I don't get to Washington terribly often. But it's lovely to be here. I remember it as a much smaller town. Yes. <laughs> but I was much younger, and things were of different proportions. So does and, anyone have a question? Oh, you're yeah. still talking. I'm sorry. And it's just delight, delight to be here watching this movie as though somebody else had written it. Which is what happens at a certain point. You find yourself staring at different scenes, wondering, when did I write that? Who was I? Because that story goes back over 50 years. I started writing it in the summer of 1962 in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> Does anyone have a question? Oh, in the back, good. No, not necessarily. Uh, across, acro across, 50, across 50 years, what um, possessed you to pick for the name of the magician something which, when you picked it, was going to be less universally known? I have no idea if it still has. Have you been explaining his name for a well, half first, a century? First, it was a double meaning. On the one hand, it was a play on Mandrake the Magician, which was a very popular comic strip then. Mandrake was always defeating villains by gesturing hypnotically. And there were even, I think, Mandrake the Magician serials, in the old days of movie serials. And the other part, of course, was the meaning of Schmendrick, which in Yiddish means the person out of his depth the boy sent to do a man's job. And I used to tell, even before I got to that point in the book, I used to tell my oldest daughter bedtime stories about the, world, the adventures of the world's worst magician. <laughs> and I got stuck. I used to, I don't get stuck as often as I did, but back then, I'd get jammed up to the point in the story and hang fire for three weeks or a month or more. And I was stuck at the Midnight Carnival. What happens then? She has to meet somebody. Whom does she meet? And Schmendrick just walked into the story out of the bedtime tales. So in a way, he's older than the book. Any other questions from anywhere in the audience? Okay. Oh, oh Mr. Jefferson. Hi. Um, so we've been hearing rumors forever and ever about a live-action version. Any hints? Are there going, is there going to be one? Have they just dropped it? Connor can tell you as much as I, possibly a good bit more. All right. Some questions I have to answer because I'm the business guy in the team, and that's a businessy question. The answer is there's a man in, in London named Michael McClepa who has the live action film rights. He's had them since 1999. He will have them until February of 2015. Pray to whatever gods, devils, or demons you believe in that he doesn't get anything done between now and then, because if he does, it will be terrible. We have been lobbying against his project from the moment we discovered that he was in charge. And luckily, uh, no one apparently wants to work with him because he's made no progress. He's had websites up for years with actors listed he never even spoke to. Wow. And all kinds of things are just so much smoke and mirrors. And so we, we basically hope that nothing will happen, the rights will come back in February 2015, and then we will get to make a good movie with real people. Because every year we field as many as eight or ten inquiries from major Hollywood players, studios, actors, actresses, managers, all kinds of people say, we want to make The Last Unicorn. And we say, go talk to Michael McClepa. But warning, he's crazy. And they all say, we're Hollywood, we can make, we do crazy every day. And they come back two weeks later licking their wounds and going, we didn't know you meant that kind of crazy. So, However, I do cherish something Christopher Lee said to me some time back, you know, explaining that by the time the movie is ready to be made, I may have passed on. Do not let it concern you. I have risen from the dead several times. I know how it's done. 
I believe him. He's 90 now, but I believe him. I'm like watching him scamper. <laughs> what made you decide on the uh, style of art for this uh, animation? I didn't have any input and beyond the script. I'm just very grateful that I did get to write the script and that they filmed it pretty much the way I wrote it. Beyond that, casting, art, art style, even if they had given me the chance, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known. I think that I thought they did very well. I wouldn't have known to go to you know, Japanese art director. I knew nothing about anime, still don't. But I do know that The Last Unicorn is considered sort of a proto-anime film, predecessor. And I'm very pleased and relieved with the way it worked out because I, when the guy who produced the movie, or got it made, Michael Chase Walker, told me rather shamefacedly and almost mumbling that he had made a deal with Rankin and Bass, whose work I hated. And I screamed at him, Rankin and Bass, why didn't you just go all the way and sell it to Hanna-Barbera? <laughs> and he looked sadly at me and said they were next. Nobody really wanted the film. And Rankin and Bass made of it the best movie they ever made. And they knew it. They know it still. So I got, I got off light for somebody lightly. Be careful with your adverbs. <clears throat> I got off lightly for somebody who didn't know really how the hell the film was going to be made. Thank you. <laughs> Peter, uh, thank you so much for writing the book. I actually have the audio book um, on Audible, and I really enjoy listening to you read it. Um, thank you. It took a long time because I was <clears throat> plagued by a cough, an allergy cough as I am right now. And we had to stop and do things over. I'd go into a coughing spasm. And it wasn't filmed, it wasn't recorded in a proper studio. We didn't have one. So every time a truck or a bus rumbled by, we had to start over. But I'm glad you liked it. It turned out really well. Um, I was wondering, have you thought about any of these characters since? Have you taken them anywhere else? Or have they developed beyond what you've rewatched a million times? Out there in the lobby, there's a book called, a book of my short stories called The Line Between. <clears throat> in there, there's a story called Two Hearts. And Two Hearts is essentially a coda or tailpiece, not quite a sequel to The Last Unicorn. Um, Characters from The Last Unicorn do turn up. It's told by a nine and a half year old girl named Suze, who has her own quest to go on. This is many years after the events of The Last Unicorn. But it does bring her into contact with some of the characters from that original story. Thank you again. I will uh, blow his horn for him since he didn't do it himself. Two Hearts went on to win the Hugo Award, it won the Nebula Award, it was nominated for World Fantasy Award, but it was robbed. Uh, and it's an amazing, amazing story. And uh, he also has written a new Schneider story set before The Last Unicorn. It's in another one of the books we have out there. And there's going to be a few more of those, and they will be in their own book sometime next year called Green-Eyed Boy. This is actually related to Two Hearts. Um, when you started writing it, did you know that it would be that much of a heart-wrenching story? No. I honestly didn't know. I have a tendency, which I always counsel young writers against, to make things up as I go along. I lucked out with that story that I did not want to write, that I fought off writing for 38 years, because Suze showed up and began telling me a story. Every once in a while you get that. You get a character who slams into your head and insists on telling a story. Usually for me it's a girl or a young woman. I'm not sure why. And once that happens, it's a gift, you have to appreciate it, but all you really have to do is take it down, as you're told. It does happen. <clears throat> We're going to move back to one of the younger members of the audience. With cool shoes. Thanks. <laughs> I like how you did, had lots of nature in the movie. I really liked that. 
Well, I'll tell you, I, I didn't know how to end the movie. That the part of when the unicorns come out of the sea, when I was writing the book, that was the hardest part. I actually skipped it and went on to the end, and then, then I came back to it. But I lived in Santa Cruz, California then, which is quite near the ocean, and I'd go down to the beach, on the cliffs above the beach, and just sit there, trying to imagine the unicorns in the sea. And there was plenty of nature around there, certainly. I spent a lot of time in the country and in rural wooded areas. So I had a lot to go on, and they faithfully reproduced a whole lot of it, especially the unicorn's journey into Haggard's country. I spent a lot of time in it, and I'm happy with what they did. But I need to tell you that I didn't know where the unicorns were any more than she did. I knew King Haggard knew where they were, and I just had to, I had to hope that he'd tell me, because I didn't know. That's what I mean about making it up as you go along. It's not a good habit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, really, it's very aggravating. Um, speaking as a person who has to edit his work and get it before it goes to the rest of the world, it's, it's always wild watching stories develop. Uh, and he will sit there and tell you that he didn't know where the unicorns were, and, and then you go through the book, and you see all these marvelous moments, like Amalfia looking out at the sea from Haggard's throne room. Ah, the sea, says Haggard. The sea is always... A, when he wrote those lines, he had no idea where he was going. But it, obviously his subconscious did. Who's got another question? Right here first. What year did the book come out, and then what year did the film come out? The book came out in 1968. The film, not till 1982. I like remembering, particularly because this is the, the German master that we used. The... Translation was done by a very old friend of mine who was at that time, in the 60s, a young poet. The German word is Wandervogel, a wandering bird, um, drifting through California, Santa Cruz, teaching a little German here and there, writing poetry, babysitting my kids. And we became very good friends to the point where I t he heard me complaining about the book so many times. It was giving me so much trouble I finally told him, Jürgen, if I ever get this done, and I wasn't sure I would, I'd already quit once, and the publishers still want it. If anybody ever wants to translate this into German, you could do it. God knows you know it as well as I do. And that was the way it worked out. The movie became a big hit in Germany. The book is still in print there. And it just satisfies me to think that because we're still friends after all these years, it still satisfies me to remember how young both of us were and what, what happened after that. Thank you so much for your work. Um, the last time I saw this movie, I was four. <laughs> I'm delighted to see it. It was on the big screen. I'm delighted to see it again on the big screen. Um, and the story, I've since read the book many, many times, but as a very small child, the story really stuck with me. Um, and. I was interested in what you said a few minutes ago about often starting with a protagonist that just kind of pops into your head, often a female. This, your work has very strong female protagonists, um, and I think that influenced me a lot as a child. And in my later work, we live now in a world where we don't have many strong female protagonists in, in uh, stories, especially movies for children. I won't name any names. But um, how do you feel about that, and what do you think about that? Um, you said the book came out in 68. Yeah. Where are we today uh, with role models and fascinating stories for girls in relation to when your story came out? Are we moving backwards or forwards? Most things in America happen to extremes, one way or the other. Um, I remember I was married to a woman from India for a long time, and she said that the thing that scared her about the country was that exactly that, that extremism in American culture. Everything's all this at one time, then it becomes all that. And there's rarely a moment of peacefulness in between. I guess I, for myself, I grew up around strong women. I'll, in New York, I'll stay with a favorite cousin. And I remember, this is, this is the Mexican side of the family, and she had a lot of friends 
who had come up from Mexico and El Salvador and Guatemala to study in New York. And I always had, usually had crushes on her friends. And it took me a while and a little growth to realize that what attracted me about them was their strength, because it had taken a lot of strength to get away from where they were and to make their way to the education and the careers they wanted. It was one, they were very different from each other, but they all had that in common. And I was affected early on by the sight and feeling of that. And on the one hand, I don't happen to be wearing it today, but I have a fair number of Buffy the Vampire Slayer shirts. <laughs> and America being what it is, the great step backwards came with Twilight. <laughs> and that's the way it is. That's the way it is in this culture. It'll swing back. It always does. They're just, as we used to say, that toothpaste is not going back in the tube. <laughs> um, the Twilight reference. He actually has a story that's going to be printed later this year, which is kind of a parody of that entire aspect of things. The title, of the working title, is Type No, big capital letters N O, and it's a vampire story. One of his very few, and you'll, I think, you'll be amused. A little tidbit for Last Unicorn fans. Uh, today, in a My Little Pony's universe, uh, Friendship is Magic, it's, it's hard, it may be tough to imagine this, but his book, The Last Unicorn, uh, essentially invented the female unicorn. Prior to 1968, it, through all of history, it's a male symbol as an archetype. Huh. You can find no references in classical literature to female unicorns, uh, nothing whatsoever except a vague 12th century monk reference to the mating habits of unicorns, which implied there must be females because there are mating habits. But, but there's never been a female unicorn in all of recorded history prior to the last unicorn. And uh, now it's such an overwhelmingly female symbol of the culture, I think he's responsible for that. So. I do have, um, <coughs> in reference to Twilight, we always stay with the same couple in Baltimore, uh, uh, Catonsville, whenever we're here, uh, wonderfully comfortable place to be. I always look forward to it, especially because the husband, Travis, brews beer in the living room. It's very good beer. We have long discussions about brewing. And it was Connor, when I was staying there, who mentioned Twilight, as I recall, that if I was going to do a vampire story, I should probably, probably see what's been going on since Anne Rice. And so I took a bottle of Travis's beer and Twilight went upstairs to the room where I sleep and work and came down a while later asking, do I have to read the whole thing? <laughs> and I said, yes, you have to read the whole thing. And I said, I'm going to need more beer. <laughs> I can't remember how many bottles it took to get through Twilight. We're going to need a bigger beer. Yes. <laughs> so who's got another question? Up here and then try to Uh, were characters like the butterfly and the skeleton based on any classic characters from mythology or folklore? Specifically, those two, no. A butterfly, I promise you, is probably as close to a self-portrait as I've drawn. The butterfly is certainly a sketch of the inside of my head at 23, which is how old I was when I started the book. There's everything in there. In the book, there's more than there is in the movie. It, everything from very old poetry to at least there are a couple a line from a play I can't really remember and also the punchline of a mildly dirty joke that my buddy Phil and I were cracking each other up with that summer um, as for the skull, the skeleton what the skull in the story brought out to a skeleton in the movie what happened was I had set myself a riddle all stories like that, have to have riddles that the hero or heroine has to solve. I simply made it up cold when the wine strings, drinks itself, when the skull speaks, when the clock strikes the right time. I just figured I'll know how that works when I get to it. And the reason that the skull skeleton is such a striking presence in the movie is that it's voiced by my friend René Aubergenois who's a wonderful actor, the best one I know, and who was not originally cast in the movie. René bullied himself, bullied his way into the movie <laughs> by threatening to show up on Rankin and Bass's doorstep every day making a public nuisance of himself. So they gave him the part. And I like, to this day, just sticking my head in for that scene, 
you know, watching him eat it up. But I had no, no mythological forerunner for that, no, no clue there. Usually I can tell you because I'd use a lot of mythological themes and characters one way or another, but not those two. Wait, you're confessing to being original. Stop. <laughs> this is I, try, I try to avoid it whenever I possibly can. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned the butterfly being a self-portrait because when I was watching it just now, I kind of thought to myself, you know, that kind of does remind me of him a little bit. But my question was going to be uh, about King Haggard. You mentioned about how uh, the young wizard was based off of uh, the, in the world's worst wizard that you told your daughter. Yeah. I was wondering if King Haggard had a similar basis in your mind or uh, where you drew inspiration for him. Haggard has a connection, direct connection to, to me, or to a part of me that's hard to explain. Haggard says at one point, I always knew, in the book, not the movie, I always knew that nothing was worth the investment of my heart, and I was right, and so I was always old. And there's a part of me that's like that. I always sympathize with Haggard. In fact, I remember telling a wonderful writer named Diana Norman, whom I never met, but we corresponded for years. In fact, I have a book of hers inscribed to Peter Beagle, the best friend I never met. We weren't going to meet in London next time I got there, but she died in her sleep at the age of 77. And I had written, we were just discussing our work, and I had written to her, I always wind up feeling sorry for my villains for the most part. And Diana wrote back, oh, I can't do that. I can only do psychos. <laughs> Which is true, she did some really terrifying psychos in her historical novels. But Haggard, every character in that book, in that book and movie is connected to me in some way. I do know where Haggard comes from, call it a negative part of myself, if you like. But he's there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, J.R.R. Tolkien um, also had a similar synthesis for the Hobbit tales. Um, it, it started as children's stories, and I know um, when he was pressed by his publishers um, later in his life to write the trilogy, um, he had a really hard time revisiting that and having that story come out. Did you have a similar hard time uh, revisiting the characters that you came up with after your child had grown up? You mean two hearts? No, that's the strange thing. I'm all upset, God knows, all over the world. What, what not? how much of a nightmare The Last Unicorn was to write. But two hearts came out as though it had just been sitting there for 38 years, you know, waiting to be released. It came out only, almost in one smooth burst, which astonished me. It was as though the universe had said, okay, you paid your, you paid your dues on that thing. Here's a freebie. There's so much more to say than that. I have to break it. <coughs> this is how two hearts came to exist. We had completed that long, grueling recording session on the last Unicorn audiobook that he mentioned. We were going to market it. He was about to show up in Atlanta at a thing called Mythic Journeys, a conference they do there every year. And I'm typing up the press release for it. And my hands, out of nowhere, my hands write that the first 3,000 people who purchased the audiobook will get a free, never-before-published story set in the world of the last unicorn. And I looked at it and said, that's a wonderful idea. He'll never say yes. So I called him up. And I pitched him, and he said no, quite fervently. I'm not going to use the language he used. He no, said, there are children here. The last unicorn was a young man's work. I'm not that man anymore. People have been asking me for three decades to write more than the last unicorn. No. How many times do I have to tell you? No. And I said, you will note that I never said sequel. I said, set in the world of. It's a big place. You're a writer. There must be other stories there. And he made a sound that was kind of like... <laughs> <laughs> and he hung up on me. And three weeks later, he sent me an email with a story attached to it. And the story had no title. And his email said, well, here it is. I don't know if it's any good. And I read it. And I cried like a baby. And I called up and said, this is wonderful. Thank you. You completely ignored my instructions. This is the sequel to The Last Unicorn, Lakota. And you do know that you can't stop here. This, this young girl is so amazing, you're going to have to write more. And he says, I know. And I said, and this will be the sequel to The Last Unicorn. You swore you'd never write. 
He said, yeah, I, I even know how it starts, so I guess I can't avoid it now. And that's how two hearts came to exist. <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a problem. When the character volunteers like that, shows up like that, then you have a responsibility. Then you have to go with her. Mind you, he's doing all this running around on a broken foot. I, I think we're coordinating a bit. Um, other than The Last Unicorn, is there a work that you have completed that uh, really changed who you were as a person or as an author? That's a good question. Um, for me, I always think it's a, it's a book in a world called The Innkeeper's Song. It actually does start as a song. I wrote it from... Innkeepers usually turn up in Tolkien, other fantasy novels, as either fat and jolly and stupid, or lean and sinister and not to be trusted. And I wanted to write a song from the point of view of an innkeeper. In this particular case, he has two women, three women, show up at his inn. One is tall and brown and travels apparently with a pet fox. One is black, walks a little like a sailor, and the innkeeper just gets a glimpse of it, realizes realize that she carries a sword cane. And the third is very pale, very white, and wears, wears a beautiful emerald ring. And they take over his inn, essentially. They take his best room, they, as he says, they take took my own room, they barred the door, they sang songs I never had heard before. Um, the ceiling shook and the plaster flew, and the fox ate my pigeons, all but two. And they carry on, they laugh, they cry, they argue, and they send down they tempt for more wine and the stable boy. <laughs> and in the morning they leave. The innkeeper hasn't a clue as to what they who they were, where they were going, what their mission was. All he knows for sure is that he's going to have to get a new stable boy. <laughs> and years later, I decided to write a novel from the point of view of everybody in that song, including the fox and the stable boy. And first, as it turned out, I was creating a world that I love sneaking back to whenever I get the chance. There are a number of stories there's one whole book of stories set in that world, and there will be another one. But the innkeeper's song, for me, is, I don't know, hesitate to say life-changing or style-changing or personal-changing, but it made that kind of a difference to me. And the best way I can say it is that there are certain books I will look back into on days when I can't write an English sentence, on days when... I don't know how to tell a story, or how I got into this, whatever I'm working on. And I will look back at the innkeeper's song and remind myself that when the wind's right and the stars are in the right alignment, I'm good. I don't look back at the last unicorn like that. It's just not the place I go to to rescue myself. But the innkeeper's song and a few other things, yes. Hard to say why. But I do think it changed me, having done it. Especially because the woman I was married to was the best writer I ever knew. And I know that her fingerprints are all over that book. And I'm very grateful even now. Does anybody have any other questions? Okay. One thing. I'll read to you in just a second. Really like uh, two more questions, and then we'll be... Um, something I've always wondered, in Mom of Fortune's Midnight Carnival, um, in the book, there's one more cage, and you left it out of the movie. And I'm wondering, was that your decision? Was it a little bit too hard to write? A little too dark? Or did it just get... No, that, that was... You mean Ellie, old age? Mm -hmm. No, that was the producer's decision. And maybe it would have been too hard for them to produce. Remember, Rankin Bass makes children's movies. And that's not a children's movie concept. It's, now that's out of mythology, definitely, because she does turn up in Norse mythology as an old lady whom the, gi the giants send into battle against the gods. 
the, the gods candidate, Thor. And Th the old lady just beats Thor to his knees. And that's when it's revealed that Ellie is old age and nobody, nobody can defeat Ellie. She also mentioned the spider in the book. Right, the, the end of the chapter. I remember writing that. There's a lot in the book I really don't remember doing, but I'm clear on the spider. Okay, last question. Does someone have a last question? Okay. Are there any questions from an audience that you would like to hear that we haven't asked yet? <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting question in itself, because I've done this so often in recent years that I've heard an astonishing number of questions. The one, I, the one that, that stayed with me was asked, I believe, in Texas. I can't remember the person who asked, but the question was, what kind of person writes a book like The Last Unicorn? That was a very good question, because I'm not sure myself. I just tried to answer it on a kind of ongoing basis, because I was one person when I was writing it, and gradually, I won't say changed, I didn't change, but other, per other parts of me assumed different proportions, and other experiences affected that. So, Artists don't stay, don't usually stay where you put them or where they put themselves, whether they want to change or not, they do. And a lot of times there have been changes I didn't want to make or didn't want to to realize were happening. So it's a question that still haunts me or I wouldn't remember it. It is kind of odd. You look at him now, he looks like the man who wrote The Last Unicorn. I mean, he just does. He, he drifts this... But he was 27 years old when he finished it. And there's actually, in the white graphic novel on the table, there's a picture of him at that age, if you want to see. Because I mean, he was young and cute and 27 years old. And he doesn't look like the man who wrote The Last Unicorn. It's very funny. Actually, my favorite cover photograph was for a book called I See By My Outfit, which has to do with a cross-country journey on a couple of motor scooters made 50 years ago, just after I'd started writing The Last Unicorn, and quit by my, the artist friend, me and the artist friend I was sharing a cabin with in the Berkshires when I started that story. And this it's an old photograph of the two of us at the age of five on our tricycles. <laughs> and um, I'm already distracted looking at something out of the picture. And he's looking straight ahead, you know, daring the photographer to say something. Kind of sums the both up. Yep, yep. So we're going to go outside and complete that. But before we go out there, I just want to mention uh, all of you by being here are now qualified to become members of the Last Unicorn Tour. So make sure you sign up and put your email address in there. There are benefits to that. You're going to be able to buy. Uh, we're going to be doing all kinds of special tour things, a special tour book, and all kinds of interesting stuff that will only be available to tour people. And anything else by Peter or related to Last Unicorn that we ever do in the next two and a half years while the tour is on, you will be able to buy at massive discounts online. So sure. by coming here today, you kind of joined the big family. So, and thank you. Thank you for coming here today. I'll see you in the lobby.